Imagine it's late spring in 1969. Your brother has invited you down for a little family get-together on Cape Cod. You're surprised. He's been so busy lately, you haven't seen him or the kids in months. He's about to head to Florida for work, and this might be the last time you're able to get together for a good long while. You help your brother clear the table. Dinner was fabulous, thank you. Don't thank me, thank Janet. That's all her handiwork. Janet's outside in the backyard playing with the kids. As you finish clearing off the table, you notice your brother has a gleam in his eye. He's almost smirking. What's so funny? Nothing. I just had a thought. Uh Uh-oh, what is it? How about once the kids are asleep, you and I play a game, for old time's sake. You don't even have to ask what game it is. You already know. It's Risk. Once the kids are asleep, you and your brother sit across from each other at the kitchen table. You open the box and spread out the board. You count out your pieces, 40 infantry each. You shuffle the cards, divide them into three piles, and take your pick. Just as you're about to start placing the infantry on your territories, you notice something. Normally, your brother has that serious expression on his face, but when you look up, he's still smiling, still has that gleam in his eye. Something on your mind? Actually, yes. What is it? You know I'm about to go on that big trip, right? Trip? (laughs) Yeah, that's one way to put it. Well, I'd like your opinion about something. Your brother jots down a few words on a notepad. He tears off the paper and slides it across the table. What do you think of this? You take the slip of paper in your hands and you read the words out loud. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, what do you think? You can't help yourself. Now there's a big smile stretched across your face too. Your response is simple. Fabulous. The man in that story is Dean Armstrong. His brother is, of course, Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. Neil maintained he made up that legendary phrase on his flight to the moon. Years later, after his brother's death, Dean told his version of the story. And we may never know which version is the truth, nor do we know who won the game of risk that night, but this much is certain. When Neil Armstrong took his first lunar step and spoke those timeless words, the world was captivated. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In Houston, NASA erupted with cheers. Even the Soviet viewing room applauded wildly. Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov later wrote of that night, everyone forgot that we were all citizens of different countries on Earth. But unfortunately for the Soviets, their celebration over space was about to come to an end. Hours after Armstrong and Aldrin's walk on the moon, the Luna 15 crashed into the lunar surface at almost 300 miles per hour. The probe shattered into pieces, and with it, the Soviets' dreams of winning the space race. Ironically, the probe collided into an area known as the Sea of Cries. But back on Earth, Americans were celebrating. As he watched the moon landing on a TV monitor, Von Braun was speechless. His vision to put a man on the moon, spurred by the tenacity of Sergei Karolov and the leadership of Kennedy, had finally come to fruition. Armstrong and Aldrin spent 21 hours and 36 minutes on the moon's surface. During that time, they collected samples and took photographs. They planted an American flag, a patch honoring the Apollo 1, and a plaque. It reads, Here, men from the planet Earth first set upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. They also received the first translunar phone call in recorded history. The man on the other end of the line was President Nixon. When the Eagle landed on the moon, Nixon was in the White House, sitting with Chief of Staff Robert Haldeman and astronaut Frank Borman. As Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface, Nixon clapped his hands in delight and spoke a single word, hooray. From the Oval Office, Nixon told the astronauts, Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. And as you talk to us from the Sea of Tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. 
and one in our prayers that you will return safely to Earth. The moon landing was a massive boost to U.S. prestige in the world. In Nixon's mind, U.S. leadership in space was part of U.S. leadership in global diplomacy. Perhaps this victory could at last bring peace. While Armstrong and Aldrin were talking to the president, Collins continued to orbit the moon alone. Mission Control said, Not since Adam has any human known such solitude as Mike Collins is experiencing during each lunar revolution when he's behind the moon with no one to talk to except his tape recorder. After 22 hours of orbiting the moon alone, Collins would finally get some company when Armstrong and Aldrin rejoined him for the journey home. On July 24, 1969, Apollo 11 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, 13 miles from the recovery ship. President Nixon flew to the Pacific and greeted the astronauts on board. America was waiting to give Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins a hero's welcome. But the astronauts would have to deal with a little unpleasantness first, 21 days of medical isolation. For three weeks, they sat in quarantine at Ellington Air Base, unable to see their families except through a window. At the time, no one knew how exposure to space would affect human beings. There were concerns the astronauts might fall ill or bring back with them unknown contagions. But the 21 days was a small price to pay. On the other side of quarantine, there was something special waiting for them. A massive celebration done in true American fashion with fireworks and confetti. After the parade, the New York Times wrote, With peeling bells, popping champagne corks, cheers, prayers, and firecrackers, a jubilant nation celebrated the safe return of the Apollo 11 astronauts. But not all Americans shared in the jubilation. One New York City government worker told reporters, Apollo 11 is totally unrelated to the issues in the United States. It doesn't do anything to help the poor. Some people refuse to believe that the lunar landing was real at all. The New York Times quoted one skeptic in Wisconsin who claimed, This is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. These guys were in Nevada the whole time and never more than 30 feet off the ground. Another in Chicago commented, These guys never walked on the moon. It was one of those Hollywood tricks. But for the majority of Americans, Apollo 11 was a triumph. Later that year, the astronauts would receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. With Apollo 11, the race to the moon was over. The U.S. had finally taken the lead from the Soviets, and it did not look like the Americans could lose their advantage in space. But on the heels of a U.S. victory, President Nixon felt it was time to run in a new direction. Beyond Apollo 11, NASA had big plans for the future, developing space stations, taking more missions to the moon, and even manning a flight to Mars. And they were going to use the energy of America's jubilation to get them there. But the sense of national pride over the launch of Apollo 11 was fleeting. Even von Braun seemed to feel a bit let down. He said, we have run out of moons. For many Americans, the competition with the Soviets was just a sideshow. The space race had taken the focus away from more important issues like the war in Vietnam and civil rights. The violence of the late 60s with the assassinations of President Kennedy, his brother Bobby Kennedy, and civil rights leaders Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X had shocked many Americans. Pouring money into space exploration suddenly seemed less important than trying to fix the problems at home. Over time, NASA's budget began to shrink. Nixon promised the country that future space exploration would have to adjust to remain sustainable. We must think of space as part of a continuing process, not as a series of separate leaps, each requiring a massive concentration of energy. Space expenditures must take their proper place within a rigorous system of national priorities. So Nixon deprioritized the space program, shuttered Apollo, and ended plans for future human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit. And although he approved the creation of the space shuttle program, he did not establish a long-term strategy for its implementation. Nixon's space doctrine was a big change from Kennedy and Johnson's more ambitious policies. But it did carry forward their hopes for cooperation in space with the Soviets. Like Eisenhower before them, Johnson and Kennedy had sought to collaborate with the Soviets on space exploration. But the Soviets largely rejected these overtures. Still, Nixon would continue to make moves to increase international cooperation. A 1970 report compiled by the Nixon administration stated, Cooperation with the Soviet Union in space matters is desirable. 
Such cooperation, if it involved substantive scientific and technical content, could be useful intrinsically, as well as from the viewpoint of raising the level of political confidence between ourselves and the Soviets and of easing international tensions. With this shift from competition to cooperation, it was clear that the space race had come to an end. The space age was entering the era of detente. Imagine it's July 30th, 1971. You're in your manned rover and you're driving fast. Well, not that fast, but it sure beats walking. John Glenn was the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth. Neil Armstrong, the first astronaut to walk on the moon. But you just accomplished a big first in space of your own, and you're very proud of it. You're the self-proclaimed first licensed driver on the moon. This is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? I've never been on a ride like this before. Oh, boy. I'm glad they got this great suspension system on this thing. The astronaut's life has been good to you. Several years back, you flew around the Earth nearly seven times on board Gemini 8. Then you were the command pilot for Apollo 9. When NASA tapped you to take the lead on Apollo 15, you were thrilled. But now, sadly, it's nearly time to go home. You and fellow astronaut James Irwin have been on the moon for three days, but it seems there's never enough time up here. You drive the rover out a little bit so that its TV cameras can catch the launch of the lunar module from the moon's surface and back to Earth. But you and Irwin have no intention of leaving. Not yet. There's one more task left, a task the men on the ground in Houston know nothing about. Uh, Dave, give me a call on your present activity. Oh, just cleaning up the back of the rover here, old Joe. Okay. And, uh, Dave, we do not have our TV yet. You might want to check TV remote. Okay, Joe. But you're not cleaning up the rover at all. And you don't want the cameras rolling yet, either. While the rover's TV camera is still down, you sneak several yards away to perform your task. You don't have much time, so you have to make quick work of it. Once you're a safe distance off, about 20 feet north of the rover, you reach into the large pocket of your spacesuit and pull out two items a small plaque, and a tiny aluminum object a little over three inches high. You bend down and place both items firmly in the moon's dust. You take a moment to consider the gravity of this moment, or lack thereof. As you stand on the lunar surface, hundreds of thousands of miles from planet Earth, you can hardly comprehend the true immensity of it all, and just how small you really are. You close your eyes and say a quick prayer of thanks. All right, okay. You get the TV camera going and the antenna aligned, then make the short moonwalk back to base and prepare for the flight home. As the lunar module lifts off, you watch out the window as the moon's rocky surface slowly fades away. You are a lucky man. Not everyone was. The astronaut in that story was Colonel David Scott. Prior to the launch of Apollo 15, Scott and a Belgian artist named Paul Van Huedonk came up with a bold idea to put a piece of art on the moon. Van Huedonk made the figurine, which he called the Fallen Astronaut. Scott snuck the small sculpture and a commemorative plaque on board Apollo 15 in his pocket. The plaque commemorated astronauts, including eight of Scott's friends, who were known to have died in the space race. Not just American astronauts, Soviet cosmonauts as well. It was a symbolic gesture, but it demonstrated that perhaps the tensions between the Soviet and American space programs were subsiding. Perhaps those tensions were even giving way to camaraderie. To the men and women who traveled to space, they were all part of a fellowship that extended beyond the boundaries of nation-states. Just a few years later, the space race would officially come to an end through another act of reconciliation, a galactic handshake. In July 1975, three astronauts on an Apollo spacecraft linked up with two cosmonauts in a Soyuz capsule. When the hatch connecting the two ships opened, Commander Thomas Stafford greeted cosmonaut Alexei Leonov with a friendly handshake. Stafford expressed hope that our joint work in space serves for the benefit of all countries and peoples on the Earth. The commanders exchanged kind words and gifts. They signed international documents. They even shared a meal. A few hours later, the astronauts said their goodbyes, returned to their ships, and went their separate ways. 
the Apollo-Soyuz test project was the first joint space flight between the Americans and the Soviets. After the fall of the Soviet Union, space cooperation between the two countries significantly increased. And to this day, the International Space Station contains both Russian and American astronauts. The space race started with a sprint to track down von Braun, climaxed with a race to the moon, and ended with a friendly embrace. It took decades and cost billions of dollars and the lives of many brave souls. But in its infancy, space exploration was nothing more than a dream, and not just the dream of one person, the dreams of multitudes, from von Braun to Karolov to Kennedy and Johnson and millions of Americans and Soviets in between. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the dream of space fostered fierce competition. But in the end, it also helped two superpowers transcend their rivalry, if only for a moment. In a story about space, it seems only fitting to give the last word to the brave man who took the first step. In 2010, Neil Armstrong wrote, Some question why Americans should return to the moon. After all, they say, we have already been there. I find that mystifying. It would be as if 16th century monarchs proclaimed that we do not need to go to the new world, we have already been there. Or as if President Thomas Jefferson announced in 1803 that Americans need not go west of the Mississippi, the Lewis and Clark expedition has already been there. Americans have visited and examined six locations on Luna, varying in size from a suburban lot to a small township. That leaves more than 14 million square miles yet to explore. 